Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. As we draw towards the end of the year and the period of celebration, I'd like to present the Watch Chronicler Awards. These include 10 categories from the most eagerly received watch to the most spectacular and of course my personal favourites. So get a cup of tea or coffee and sit back for a critical retrospective of the past 12 months. Before I begin, like, share and subscribe to catch all the latest here on the YouTube channel. Our podcast is now live on Spotify as well as SoundCloud, and will soon be live on iTunes too. Take a look at our Instagram page where we present regular photos and previews. Of course, head over to watchchronicle.com for full articles and features, many of which are available only in written form and include varied themes from history to new releases. For this award, I first thought of the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra Ultralight, but in truth, the watch to win this award is at once unlikely and absolutely inevitable. It's the Citizen EcoDrive Calibre 0100. Whilst the titanium and white gold case is beautifully designed to resemble the quartz crystal at its core, and adorned with beautiful finishing, it's the movement of this Citizen which has won the award. Hinted at by the dial which doubles as a photovoltaic cell, and is adorned with beautifully cut markers to rival any other brand, this is an EcoDrive solar movement. Without light, this 17 joule movement can run for 6 months, yet when exposed to light the battery simply won't run out. This is, however, one of the least impressive aspects of the watch. In this piece, Citizen has invested all of its mechanical might into creating something truly groundbreaking and superlatively accurate. In fact, this movement can keep to just one second per year, making it the most accurate watch ever made. Surely this must be worthy of praise. The price of $7,400 for specially treated titanium, or $16,800 for white gold, is steep, but the technology enclosed is completely unmatched by the rest of the industry, and so I don't see why they can't charge whatever they like. Central to the accuracy of the watch is the AT cut quartz crystal, which oscillates at 8.39 MHz rather than the conventional 32.8 kHz that one sees in normal watches. This equates to being 256 times faster. This crystal also allows the watch to be less positionally affected. To account for temperature, the movement adjusts itself once per minute. To complete this sense of accuracy, the exquisitely cut hands hit the markers perfectly thanks to technology to realign the hands after a shock or magnetic influence, and LIGA technology avoids any kind of backlash. Clearly this watch deserves to win the award, not to mention making a wonderful dress watch with a 37.5mm case. It's rare to come across a watch which may really change the way we look at watches in general, and I have a somewhat left field watch which I think may well be of significance. This is the Habring Perpetual Doppel. Founded in 2004 by Richard Habring, the man to create a split-second chronograph out of the value of 7750 for IWC, Habring is a small Austrian brand which makes fewer than 500 watches per year, yet develops amazing complications. Importantly, their watches use the simplest way to achieve a given complication, a choice which avoids the lack of reliability issues seen across the industry. For their A11P movement, they've used their own supply chain to create a moon phase perpetual calendar split-second monopusher chronograph for €21,500. In essence, they've taken a complication which usually would require the might of Petit Philippe to achieve, as well as an incredibly high budget, and have rebuilt them with a phenomenally pragmatic approach. And so by using the fabled architecture of the 7750 from Velju, which Habring himself worked on quite significantly at IWC, they've managed to reduce the price of this watch by about 10 times from the general price you would pay for a watch with these complications in this industry. Furthermore, it's a beautifully designed watch with a wonderful dial arrangement and stunning levels of brushing and matting paired with gilt elements and the typical monopusher look. Of course, it is a modular design, so the movement is relatively thick, yet for this level of complication and Habring's pincer design for engaging and disengaging the split seconds, it's a real treat to see through the case back. I'm feeling this watch and movement set a precedent for what we should be seeing in this industry, which is brand designing a watch with know-how and pragmatism, not undue complication, and with a sensible price. Earlier this year, the legendary dive firm Doxa reintroduced the Sub-200 T-Graph, their diving chronograph. However, they first released the solid 18 karat gold version, and I know that divers need weights in order to sink, but quite frankly a solid gold watch is, uh, is a bit excessive. Sure, with a 43mm case and 200m water resistance, it has diving credentials and also gains some serious vintage kudos by using a restored manual Velju 7734 chronograph, which was made in the late 20th century. However, it also costs 70,000 US dollars for each and every one of the 13 made. And is it just me who thinks that 13 is an odd number to make? 
because this can't even be due to a lack of movement supply, as they're also making a steel version with the same movement. For around that price you could get a solid gold GMT Master from Rolex, and an Omega Seamaster 300 also in solid gold. The scale of the madness behind this watch is staggering, although with a smaller brand as Doxa, with an even smaller number of these watches to make, I suppose the price was inevitable. Whether the 13 watches have been bought, I don't know, but what I do know is that this seriously drew the eye to the later release steel version, which I think is absolutely stunning. I think that in this context, the title of most bizarre release of the year really could go to only one watch, even if there is something strangely alluring about the pairing of a gold case and the inimitable Doxa sawtooth bezel and orange professional dial. This year there's massive competition for the award for the best vintage inspired watch. However, I'm not rewarding the closest remake of vintage watch, but rather the best watch first and foremost, which draws from vintage influences. Several watches could have won this, from the exquisite Zenith El Primero A384 revival to Breitling's remake of the Navitimer 806 from the late 1950s. Yet the watch which wins this award is the Omega Speedmaster Apollo 11 50th Anniversary in 18 karat moonshine gold, a lighter colour of gold proprietary to Omega. And so this isn't the platinum version with the remake of the 321 calibre, but I'll explain why. The reason why I've chosen this watch to win is interestingly not immediately obvious. Personally, I would never wear a solid gold piece like this one, yet I respect what this watch stands for. When the original version of this watch, complete with its onyx markers, black hands and brown bezel, was released in 1969, it was created to be given to leading members of the US government and the astronauts as a congratulatory item after the moon landing. Whilst government policy prevented this to an extent, it did mark a full stop after Omega's achievement. In the same way, the new watch ends the era of the Omega 1861 movement with the introduction of the 3861, a master coaxial version with the same immense anti-magnetism and coaxial escapement. For me, it also presents an opportunity to close a door on the past and for the Speedmaster to look to the future after this momentous anniversary. In the meantime, this 32,000 Swiss franc watch is a phenomenally well done remake of the original, with unsurprisingly a virtually unchanged case and dial, which to my eye improves on the original having handled both watches. With the Coase 1159, Audemars Piguet could have expected to get the award for the most surprising release of the year. However, whilst woefully mismarketed and poorly released, this is actually quite a nicely made watch, and an eminently well engineered one too, which was needed in their range. The watch which wins this award is in fact much stranger, but to me wonderfully so. Tudor is a brand which I regard as rather popular but rather dull in terms of their range, which includes watches which look to the Black Bay for inspiration even when quite frankly they aren't dive watches. Consequentially, the Black Bay P01 came as some surprise, but is much more right to wear the Black Bay logo than most. Inspired by a prototype offered to the US Navy by Tudor in 1967, the P01 uses a long 42mm case with hinged lugs resembling the links of a bracelet. In place of a dive bezel is installed a bidirectional bezel locked and released by a hinge part of the upper lug, which gives you a 12 hour GMT scale, or the ability to simply time hours. It's unique, strange and rather delightful. Aside from this, the matte dial and printed markers give a more simple, basic and prototype-like aspect to this watch. Internally, the watch remains modern, with one of the MT5600 series movements, with automatic winding, a long power reserve, as well as silicon parts, and so it really is a modern watch in this way, but the design is so wacky and off the wall, as well as having a slightly unfinished feel, which is clearly deliberate. I think this is a wonderful watch. And so whilst an odd dive watch, Tudor may just have made a perfect explorer's watch for a price of £2,920, and something which certainly won't be boring. Whilst the replacement of the primary Petit Philippe chronograph, the 5170, with a new watch in the form of the 5172, was momentous and very well received with Art Deco lugs and a beautiful new dial, there was another watch which was received even more warmly, the Zodiac Aerospace GMT. Released in response to the immense success and growing waiting lists for Zodiac's diver, the Super Seawolf, Zodiac released the Aerospace. This remake of one of the brand's vintage models, in an edition of 182 per colour, really took the world by storm. With such limited numbers, the idea of buying a uniquely designed GMT watch which wasn't a Rolex offshoot was an appealing one. Interestingly, Zodiac did not simply use the Super Seawolf's case, but rather changed the placement of brushing, added bevels and changed the lug shape entirely. Likewise, the hands, bezel and markers were more delicate to add a touch of aviation to this design. 
Zodiac was also extremely wise to give this piece colour, with both a muted black and grey version, which I must say I prefer, and a blue and orange gulf version. Meanwhile, the movement was the very widely used ETA2893-2 to offer a GMT function at a sensible price. Zodiac is, of course, a brand which has gained an immense following in the last couple of years, thanks to models like this which appear to catch the public's interest very effectively. As far as I'm concerned, this is a brand to watch as a result of a clear understanding of quality and imagination, which are two aspects of watches which don't often go together. This next category was a very hotly contended one, with three watches springing to mind. First we have the Tissot Gentleman. This watch offers a silicon spring for a very reasonable price, around £1,000, however it is somewhat dull and virtually nobody will see the benefits of this new spring. Then there's the Smith's Everest Expedition, which I reviewed a few days ago. A beautiful watch, but one with serious availability issues. However, the true best value watch of the year is a version of a watch which won last year, the Formex Essence Legera. This 43mm sports watch offers the same sprung inner case to absorb physical shocks and to conform to the wrist, with the same impeccable quality. The watch is now more expensive, with prices starting at £1,650, but with very good cause. The mass of the case has been reduced to only 50 grams by making the inner case from titanium, the bezel from virtually scratch-proof zirconia ceramic, and the case from immensely light and very strong carbon fibre. This really is the perfect watch for extreme sport, especially the model with the matching lightweight dial. Internally this watch is fitted with the STP1-11, a more decorated and complex alternative to the ETA2824, which you actually can only buy in chronometer grade. And so for the money, this is a remarkable watch from a very new manufacturer, considering the materials, the 100 meter water resistance, and the sheer quality of this item as a whole. The award for the most spectacular watch must go to the MBNF, released just a few days ago. With the legacy machine Thunderdome, MBNF has created the fastest moving tourbillon ever made. It achieves this with a triple axis tourbillon engineered by a man who created the legendary JLC Gyro Tourbillon. This watch is apt for the award even from its dimensions, with a 44 by 22.2 mm case and a practically hemispherical sapphire crystal. Aside from the brilliant case, the guilloche inner surface, enamel dial and blued hands give a highly lustrous appearance. To add to this, much of the arrangement of the manually wound 45 hour movement was conceived by the great watchmaker Karavutalainen and incorporates his straightforward and rounded aesthetic. Above all, both literally and figuratively, this watch has a triple axis tourbillon with three cages completing a rotation in 8, 12 and 20 seconds respectively, whilst the balance wheel is spherical. The balance spring is housed at the core of this sphere and is cylindrical as seen on marine chronometers. And so this watch is quite a rare balance of spectacle and really remarkable watchmaking. Naturally the price of this watch is a fantastic 270,000 Swiss francs plus VAT, yet we can all marvel at its splendour and just the sheer achievement of what's been, been done here. Now we come to my favourites amongst dress watches and sports watches. And my favourite dress watch this year is a piece which will probably forever be out of my means, but is nonetheless an extremely exciting watch. It's the Vacheron Saint-Ain Twin Beat Perpetual, a watch which appeals to my love for movements with long power reserves. As a dress watch, this is a flawed timepiece. Its 42mm case is too large to be a traditional watch, yet its movement is something truly new. With a rose engine turned guilloche pattern on the upper half of the dial, and a sapphire crystal on the lower portion, it's quite a spectacle to see. However, it's the perpetual calendar on the subdials seen here which really explain the movement. Perpetual calendars are a pain to reset if the watch stops, so this watch has a 65 day power reserve. Normally such a watch would have an enormous spring, such as for example the 31 day Langer 31, which has a 3.7 meter cumulative um, length for the springs. Instead this has two separate balances. One runs the very accurate high beat 5 hertz or 36,000 vibrations per hour for daily accurate wear, whilst the other runs the low rate of 1.2 hertz or 8,640 vibrations per hour thanks to an ultra thin balance spring which enables this to be able to keep the watch running when the watch isn't being worn for those 65 days, although some say it can actually run for over 70. I must say that I find this technology remarkable, and the idea of being able to switch between two beat rates to have a standby mode and a standard accurate running mode is absolutely inspired, and a really brilliant way of creating a long power reserve watch. And of course, whilst you could just have an automatic watch instead of this, I find the fact they've gone to this length to create such a long power reserve really quite remarkable. 
My favourite sports watch is a difficult point, as whilst I've appreciated the boldness of Tudor's P01 and the wonders of my own Smith's Everest expedition, the watch which I simply like the most from this year is the Zenith El Primero A384 Revival. Ironically, the reason why I like it so much is because it isn't the traditional Zenith remake. While the vast majority of the watches in the El Primero line are very similar to the most successful late 60s models, this isn't, but rather is a remake of one of the less popular models from this period. It uses a beautiful case with a sunburst brushed surface, very sharp bevels and an angular form. It also doesn't try to look old, with beautiful dial printing and a domed sapphire crystal whilst keeping the practicality of 100 meter water resistance. The dial detailing is sublime, with layers and levels down to the second track on the date window and the red second hand. Naturally, it also uses the legendary El Primero 400 high beat column wheel chronograph, which is as beautiful as it is accurate and reliable. Its power reserve remains very acceptable at 50 hours, and the presence of a date is an oft unappreciated convenience. It also comes with a stunning latter bracelet and an exhibition case back, essentially the only change to the original, permitting a wonderful view of this spectacular movement. In short, it's absolutely stunning, a gem of detail, care and respect for the design, and it's also priced fairly reasonably in order to be able to be a sensible proposition considering the features you get and the complications within the watch. However, I'll conclude there, but do tell me what watches have stood out to you this year, and why in the comments down below. Also, remember to like, share and subscribe to see more on this channel, and take a look at our podcast on Spotify and SoundCloud. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armand from WatchChronicle.com, out.